so we're going to talk about physical activity and we want to start by understanding what are the guidelines for all Americans and these include the guidelines for people with spina bifida. The guidelines recommend that everyone get 150 minutes a week of moderate aerobic physical activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous activity or a combination of the two of those, as well as at least two days a week of muscle strengthening for all your major muscle groups. It's also recommended that if you can't meet these guidelines to be as active as you can and to avoid sedentary activity if you're not at this level yet. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to ramp up a program from your baseline. It's also helpful to get support from a physical therapist or a certified inclusive fitness trainer, as well as your physiatrist before you start an exercise program. The things that we want to include in a physical activity program would be aerobics, which would be getting, they use your large muscles and you'll be getting your uh, heart rate and your respiratory rate increased and strength training and stretching. And so I want to briefly touch on physical activity for children and their guidelines. For ages three to five, it's important to encourage daily movement through active play. When a child gets up to the ages of six to 17, the requirement is for 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity and three days a week of strengthening. And so exercise in the school setting that also counts towards your energy expenditure and towards these minutes. And so parents can collaborate with the gym teacher. And the other thing is that under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, schools are required to provide adaptive fitness to children who qualify. So in other words, if the child has an IEP, then uh, adaptive physical fitness should be provided. And so these are just some examples of amount of physical activity, as I mentioned, that's required, and some different types of physical activity. There's all different types, but you know things that would increase your strength would be things like tug of war or hitting a large ball, newing and paddling, and even body weight strength training. So these are all different types of physical activity, and it's important to find something that the family as a whole you know, enjoy that can be done together. So as I mentioned, there's three parts of physical activity. There's um, aerobic strengthening and uh, stretching. Stretching is very important to prevent injury, and there's different types of stretching. There's dynamic stretching, and there's static stretching. Dynamic stretching, we typically recommend that before you do a physical activity session. So this is large movements of the large muscle groups, and that warms up your joints and your ligaments and tendons and muscles. It also warms up your body. And so this example here is somebody doing arm crosses. So their arms are out and then they're crossing over. So it's a large movement and it can get your heart rate up. The other thing that's recommended is static stretching, but typically we recommend doing this at the end of the physical activity session. And so you could do either a multi-joint stretch or a single joint stretch. A multi-joint stretch is indicated in the image on the left is when, for example, this person is stretching their, their muscles around their shoulder, around their elbow, and around their wrist. Whereas a single joint stretch, the image indicates that the person is stretching only their wrist um, uh, extensor muscles. And so that's the kind of thing that you want to do at the end of the session after you're already warmed up. And typically we recommend that you hold these stretches for at least 30 seconds. There's also various types of strength training. And some of these, especially body weight strength training, you don't need any type of equipment. You're just doing it with your own body. So the example that I have here in the image is showing somebody doing a bent knee push-up. The other thing that people sometimes like to do is resistance bands because you can carry these with you when you travel. They're easy and small and they can provide a nice uh, program for strengthening. Barbells and machines are also other options. And Importantly, we want to include aerobic activity. So these are activities like football, basketball, swimming. These are all activities that are going to increase our heart rate, our respiratory rate. And importantly, as Michelle had mentioned, they're going to increase energy expenditure. How do we know 
if the guidelines say that we should we should exercise at a moderate intensity level, how do we know that we're exercising at a moderate intensity? One of the ways that we measure this is by using a rating of perceived exertion scale. There's two scales pictured here. One is the wheel rating of perceived exertion scale, and one is the Borg scale. The wheel scale was validated in people with spina bifida who were doing a graded exercise stress test. And the Borg scale has been used for a number of years and, and can also be used. It's a very simple scale. It goes from one to 10. And as you can see on that scale, a moderate range would be a four, five, or six. And that number correlates typically with your heart rate. So if you're at a four, you well, you multiply it and it should be around 140. So you're you're exercising at more of a moderate range. And so these scales can be helpful if you have a small version that you could take with you. Or the other way that you can monitor your level of intensity is that you can use the talk test. So, you know, if you're able to talk while you're exercising, you know, that's more of a moderate intensity. But if you get to the point where you can't, you know, sing a song when you're exercising, you're more into the vigorous range. So there's various ways to monitor how exerted you are and whether you're reaching up into that moderate range. Importantly, we want to make sure that we're preventing injury when we're exercising. So as I mentioned, stretching is a very important component. We also want to listen to our body. You, Many people have delayed onset muscle soreness that may set in, and that just means you worked your muscles. And so they may feel sore in general. But if you have severe pain in a joint, then you want to see your physician. We also recommend slowly ramping up to meet the physical activity guidelines. So you're not going to start at that 150 minutes a week. It's okay that you're not there. You start slow and you build up and I'll tell you how to do that. I'll give you an example. The other thing is to work with healthcare professionals. If you have a prior injury, for example, if you injured your shoulder in the past, before you start an exercise program, you can meet with a a uh, physical medicine and rehab doctor or a physiatrist and a PT or an OT to work on improving the strength and range of motion around that joint before you start an exercise program. And for example, physical therapists can help you to establish an exercise program that then you can carry over into a community-based fitness center like a gym. Additionally, it's very important that you set yourself up for success. So you want to make sure that you or your child's wheelchair is uh, fits well, provides adequate pressure relief, that the arm position in relation to the wheel and propulsion is fitting properly, is, is set up properly for efficient propulsion. And to do this, you're, you'll want to work with a physical or occupational therapist who is an assistive te technology provider and your physiatrist, and they can collaborate to ensure that the fit of the wheelchair is set before you start a physical activity program. So how do you develop a physical activity program? Well, there's a there's a number of things that are listed here on the slide. And writing a goal is something that both Joanne and Michelle mentioned behavioral change. Writing goals are part of behavior change. So we oftentimes write a SMART goal, and I'll give you an example of that. And that's something that's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. And when we write that SMART goal for physical activity, we can apply the FIT principle, which stands for frequency, intensity, time, and type. And those are the parameters by which we can measure whether that goal is being met. We also want to start low and go slow. Again, listen to our body. Try to avoid the weekend warrior syndrome when we do all the exercise on the weekend. And really take the time to find activities that you and your child, you and your family enjoy. And working out with a buddy is also recommended. Also, decreasing sedentary behaviors is, is important. There's been more and more research studies in this area finding that reducing time, the time that you spend in sedentary activities, which means you're sitting, you know, at a monitor all day at your work, for example, that would be an example of sedentary behavior. But what think, start thinking about what can you do to increase activity throughout your day? 
So taking breaks every hour for five minutes and, you know, wheeling or walking around and moving intermittently, that's going to increase that overall energy expenditure throughout the day. And that's on top of, you know, planning some planned exercise or physical activity sessions. So we want to talk about how to, what is a SMART goal? And as I mentioned, it's a goal that you write that's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. This is an example of a SMART goal. In four weeks, I'll push my wheelchair from my dormitory to my class that's across campus five minutes faster than my baseline time of 20 minutes. And so looking at this chart here, what I want you to see is that this is an application of the FIT principle to the SMART goal that we wrote. So on the left-hand side, you see frequency, intensity, time, and type. And across the top, you see there's a baseline where that person is at baseline with these measures and weeks one through four. At baseline, this person, what they're doing for physical activity is they look at the type, they're propelling their wheelchair on a level surface. They're doing that for 20 minutes at light intensity four times a week. Now, week one, they're only going to change one parameter. So each, the important thing here is that you're only changing one variable per week. So at week one, the only thing that they're changing is the number of days that they're doing their propulsion. So at week one, they change it, they ramp it up to five days a week. During week two, the number of times a week stay the same, but they've changed the intensity level. And if you look at the type, what they've done is they've added heels in. So that can increase your heart rate, that increases the power that you need and the energy that you need. And so your intensity goes up. And so they've kept all their parameters the same, except for the moderate intensity. Week three, the person has increased their minutes. So they're going from 20 to 25 minutes. And then in week four, they're decided to keep all the other parameters the same, except for now they're ramping up in to include moderate to vigorous intensity activities. So adding more hills into that program that they have. So you can see how overall this fit principle can apply to your SMART goals when you're writing them to make them more measurable and time-based. These are some resources. Um, the My Wheelchair Guide that's listed there provides you with information on wheelchair fit, wheelchair maintenance, and how to get through the wheelchair service delivery process. And that's on the United Spinal website. Also, the physical activity guidelines are listed there. And the National Center for Health, Physical Activity, and Disability is a really nice resource where you can find videos and more information about physical activity. And we will provide you with a separate PDF of a list of funding resources, things like Challenged Athletes Foundation that you can write um, to obtain adaptive uh, sports equipment, such as a hand cycle or wheelchair basketball chair. And then the next two slides provide you with various resources on adaptive recreation and fitness. And this is the final slide that includes additional information on adaptive fitness. And one thing I wanted to point out is the Discover Accessible Fitness that's on the NCHPAD website. That's really good if you're going to work out in a gym and use machines. It really tells you and highlights nicely um, the balance that you need to use and exercise when you're using the fitness equipment. Thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to turn it over to Jen Tudor, and she's going to talk about re research.